Welcome to our introduction to insulin pumps. Some of the information that you'll be shown today may be a review, but it's helpful to understand how an insulin pump works. If there's anything that you don't understand, please go back and rewatch that section. Do you know where insulin comes from before a person develops diabetes? If you said the pancreas, you're correct. The body stores some sugar in the liver. Throughout the day and all night long, the liver releases small amounts of sugar into the bloodstream. It's the fuel that our bodies need for energy. The pancreas continuously releases small amounts of insulin directly into the bloodstream to keep the blood sugar steady. This is known as basal. Then, when we eat, the pancreas releases just enough insulin to bring blood sugar back to that steady rate. That's called bolus. An insulin pump mimics both basal and bolus insulin, which we'll discuss in a moment. A person living with diabetes must use other ways to deliver correct amounts of insulin to the body to keep blood sugars within target range. These insulin delivery devices act the way a healthy pancreas would. They include injecting a vial of insulin using a syringe, a preloaded insulin pen, or an insulin pump. An insulin pump is basically a small computerized device that continuously delivers insulin. They're no bigger than a deck of playing cards, and the settings get programmed for each individual. To be successful with an insulin pump, here's what needs to happen. Before getting the pump, start by discussing it as a family. Teamwork is very important, so every player needs to want that pump, not just the person who's going to wear it. Your team, in addition to the doctor and nurse educators at the UMass Memorial Pediatric Diabetes Clinic, is also made up of your family and anyone else who helps you manage diabetes when family is not available. Team members must be good problem solvers, like knowing how to treat a low blood sugar, a high blood sugar, and when and how to check for ketones. It's important to be comfortable and accurate when counting carbohydrates, so we'll have you meet with our nutritionist for a review before starting on a pump. It's also important for all team members to be willing to check your blood sugar at least four to six times each day if you're not using a continuous glucose monitor, and communication with your diabetes care team is essential. Now, let's take a look at some of the terminology related to insulin pumps. We'll start with basal insulin. When injecting with a syringe or an insulin pen, you take a long-acting insulin like Lantus, Basaglar, Levomir, Tegeo, or Traceba. That's your basal insulin. It remains steady in your bloodstream for about 24 hours, then you'll need another dose. But when using an insulin pump, that changes because you'll only be using rapid-acting or fast-acting insulin like Humalog, Novolog, or Apidra. No longer will you need long-acting insulin unless you're having an issue with your pump, so you'll have it on hand just as a backup. The rapid-acting insulin from the pump provides a steady dose around the clock. This is called your basal rate. It's the same way a pancreas works. The basal rate is dosed in units per hour. You're probably familiar with what a bolus is. It's a larger dose of rapid-acting insulin given at one time, usually before meals. There are two types of bolus. The first is food, which is your insulin-to-carb ratio, the dose of insulin that covers the amount of carbohydrates you're about to eat. The second is a correction bolus, which is used to bring a high blood sugar back down into target range. Three calculations will determine your pre-meal insulin bolus. First, uses your insulin to carb ratio, which is the number of grams of carbohydrates covered by one unit of rapid acting insulin. Second is the correction factor, which is only used if your current blood sugar is above your target range. It's calculated using your target blood sugar and your insulin sensitivity factor, which is how many points one unit of insulin will lower your blood sugar. The sensitivity factor is provided by your care team. The correction factor formula is your current blood sugar minus your target blood sugar divided by your insulin sensitivity factor. The final step to calculate the pre-meal insulin bolus dose is to add those first two results together. Let's look at an example. It says the meal contains 55 grams of carbohydrates and the person's insulin to carb ratio is 1 to 15. 55 divided by 15 is 3.6 units of rapid-acting insulin needed for those 55 carbs. If your current blood sugar is higher than the target range before a meal, you'll need to calculate the correction factor. Again, that's the insulin dose needed to bring the blood sugar back into target range. 
In this example, the current blood sugar is 232. Subtract 150, which is the target. 232 minus 150 is 82, which divided by their insulin sensitivity factor, which in this example is 50, equals 1.6 units of rapid-acting insulin needed to bring the blood sugar back into target range. Now add those two results together. 3.6 plus 1.6 is 5.2. So they need to bolus 5.2 units of rapid-acting insulin for that meal. This can be confusing at first. Please rewind and listen to this again if it didn't make sense the first time. You will pick it up very quickly. Here are some other terms you should know. Stacking is when rapid-acting boluses are given too close to each other. That can result in hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Insulin on board, or IOB, is the amount of insulin still active in the body from the last bolus. When a bolus is given, that rapid-acting insulin lasts three to four hours. Your care team will preset that into your pump. That setting helps to prevent stacking of insulin and allows for a more accurate bolus. IOB is insulin that's already been administered and cannot be adjusted. So how does the pump calculate insulin on board? Let's say you took insulin for a meal at 11 a.m. and then needed a correction bolus at 1 p.m., the pump would automatically subtract some insulin based on the settings by your provider. The infusion set is the narrow flexible tubing that connects the insulin pump to the person, and the cannula is a short flexible tube that gets inserted just under the skin and connects to the infusion set. Infusion sets and cannulas are a little bit different for each pump. Now let's talk a little bit about hypoglycemia, which means low blood sugar. It's important to know the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, which is defined as blood sugar below 70. You may already wear a continuous glucose monitor, or CGM. Insulin pumps and CGMs are basically small computers, and as we all know, sometimes computers don't work as well as they should. So if your CGM shows a blood sugar of less than 70 or above 250, you should still check it against a finger stick just to be sure it's accurate. To treat a low blood sugar, use the rule of 15s. When blood sugar is below 70, eat or drink 15 grams of a rapid-acting carbohydrate. Examples of these include 4 ounces of orange juice or a juice box containing 15 grams of carbs, 1 tablespoon of honey, or 1 tube of Cake Mate decorator gel. You can also use glucose tabs, but read the label because you have to eat 4 tablets to equal 15 grams. Then wait 15 minutes and check the blood sugar again. If it's back above 70, eat a snack that contains 15 grams of complex carbohydrate, like peanut butter, cheese and whole wheat crackers, or peanut butter on apple slices. There are lots of choices for the snack. But if the blood sugar is still below 70, repeat steps 1 and 2 and continue this until you're back above 70. Hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar, must also be monitored. You want to avoid diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, so check ketones if blood sugars are above 240. Now that's lower than what you were originally taught. This is because your pump could have a kinked cannula, blocked cannula, or the cannula could have come out a little. Remember, when using an insulin pump, you don't have long-acting insulin to prevent DKA. If this happens, you might not realize how long you haven't been receiving insulin, so it's important to change the site right away, even if you just put a new one on. Never assume that a new site is a good site. Take a correction using a syringe or an insulin pen to be sure that you get the dose. Then restart the insulin pump and recheck blood sugars and ketones in two hours. DKA can develop quickly, and it's considered a medical emergency. Become familiar with those signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia and always check for ketones if you're above 240. Never assume that stomach pain, headache, or vomiting is illness-related. Always check for ketones and call your doctor or care team if ketones are moderate to large so that we can help you calculate a correction. While an artificial pancreas has not been created yet, there are hybrid closed-loop systems on the market that allow a continuous glucose monitor to communicate with an insulin pump. The pump receives blood sugar readings every five minutes and automatically adjusts background or basal insulin based on that updated information. You still have to let the pump know about the number of carbohydrates you're going to eat and when to deliver that bolus dose of insulin. 
There are some challenges that come with using an insulin pump, including an increased risk of hyperglycemia and DKA. Infusion sets can get crimped, air bubbles, clogs in the cannula, or tubing pulling out. Also, it will take a few weeks to get adjusted to an insulin pump, so definitely be patient. You will have more appointments when starting on a pump, and you'll have to get used to constantly being attached to the pump and figuring out how to adjust your clothing. There are many creative tips and tricks that people have come up with, and there's even a pump belt with pockets to hold the pump and a CGM receiver, which can be worn under your clothing. The advantages of using insulin pump therapy are it provides more precise dosing and multiple basal rates for different situations. For example, if you play a sport after school, you might want a lower basal rate during that time. The pump also provides immediate access to insulin. It's easier to match insulin to food and exercise, and also to increase, decrease, or stop insulin delivery when needed. As we talked about earlier, the pump will manage your insulin on board to help avoid stacking, and you'll have fewer pokes because the pump is changed every two to three days. Everyone has their own opinions about insulin pump therapy and what to expect. Sometimes expectations are unrealistic, so it's very important to get your questions answered beforehand. For example, the pump will not cure your diabetes. We want to improve your blood sugar control, but it still won't be perfect, and even though taking a bolus is easier, you still can't eat anything you want whenever you want. As they say, everything in moderation. You can expect that with improved blood sugar control, you might feel better. It also offers more flexibility with what you can eat. But remember to be patient. It will take several weeks to adjust to insulin pump therapy. This video should have given you some things to think about and to discuss as a family. Consider the features that appeal to you about an insulin pump. Different pumps offer various benefits. Some questions for you to consider are, how many units of insulin does the pump hold? Would a pump with or without tubing be best? Do we need a pump that's waterproof? What reminders and alarms does each pump have? How finely can basal rates be programmed? Make sure to write down all of your questions. And finally, here are some resources that you can use to learn about what each pump does or does not do. Take some time to explore these links that you could use to compare all of the available pumps. Now we ask that you please take the short quiz in the link below and let our office know once you've completed it. And as always, contact your UMass Memorial Pediatric Diabetes Care Team with any questions or concerns, and we will be happy to help you.